Hey, thank you for coming back. You know, I don't like studying alone. Let's study together. Let's do this thing together. Let's make this community grow. This week, we are studying the Torah Parsha Zav. I know you can see it there. Um, of course, we'll be using the handy dandy Hayenu. Zav means command, as in you command. Da -da -da, and you know, as we look at these Torah Parsha, parsha portions, <clears throat> you can always see where that, why they call it command. So in verse two, we have command Aaron and his son. So tell Aaron, command Aaron. So that's what our Torah portion is called. So let's get into it. We're starting today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I was sneezing a little bit earlier. So if I'm clearing my throat and stuff. Um, we are in Vayikra chapter six, two powerful chapters. Last week, we learned about the, um, the, Corbanot, the offerings, and um, we started getting a little bit into the statutes, what happens if with money and financial things. So let's get into it. Vayikra chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Command Aaron and his sons thus, This is the ritual of the burnt offering, which we know as the Olah offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain where it is burnt, upon the altar all night long, excuse me, all, all night until morning while the fire on the altar is kept going on it. The burnt offering itself shall remain where it is burned on the altar all night until morning while the fire on the altar is kept going on it. Let's see, what does that mean? That's kind of interesting. <clears throat> um, okay, this is interesting. So Rashi says the expression command always implies urging on or urging on to carry out a command implying to that it comes into force at once and is binding upon future generations um let's see okay so this is the law of the burnt offering this paragraph is intended to teach with reference to the burning of the fat portions and the limb of the sacrifice um the teaching and to teach regarding disqualified sacrifices, which of them, if already brought up on, on the altar, must be taken down. And which, if brought up, need not to be taken down. Okay, so we're going to get into the nitty gritty here, it looks like. <clears throat> okay, verse 3. The priest shall dress in linen raiment. Wait. Okay, so we just went one, one pasuk in about... Command Aaron and his sons that the burnt offering is going to stay. This is the this is the ritual. This is the the instructions for the Ola offering. It's going to stay where it is all night long until morning, while the fire is kept burning underneath it. Um, what's that called? Um, what do we have that we have eternal flame? <laughs> um, kind of thing sounds like. <clears throat> and then we jump into clothing. The priest shall dress in linen raiment with linen breeches next to his body, and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and place them beside the altar. So the ashes go on the side of the altar, looks like. And then he shall take off his vestment and put on other vestments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a pure place. Okay, so we got a couple of wardrobe changes that the priests do. Um, he shall put off his garments. This is not compulsory. This is Rashi. But it's a matter of decency so that he should not, through removing the ashes, soil his garments. Okay, so he's like in his breeches, his, his underclothes, his long johns or whatever, when he's doing the ashes. Um, and the garments in which he's regulated to minister at the altar. And the clothes he wore when he boiled the pot for his master. He should not pour out a glass of wine for him. Okay, so... And on this account, it states, and he shall put on other garments inferior to those in which he ministers at the altar. And that's in Tractate Yomah 23b and Shabbat 114a, which is in the Oral Torah. Okay. <clears throat> so he's got different... It makes sense. So he doesn't want to get his uh, clothes dirty. <clears throat> Hashem doesn't want him to get his clothes dirty. Verse 5, the fire on the altar shall be kept burning not to go out every morning the priest shall feed wood to it lay out the burnt offering on it and turn into smoke the fat parts of the offerings of well-being that sounds like the tamid offering <coughs> excuse me the fire on the altar shall be blazing on it 
Um, the scripture uses here many expressions from the root uh, yakid to ignite the fireplace. A continual fire shall be blazing upon the altar. Yeah, so the continual or eternal flame, fire kind of idea that we were talking about. Yeah, this is the morning continual burnt offering. Um, it looks like the tamid offering that you do forever. Uh, okay. So they got to keep that fire going on the altar. And you expect in the morning to stoke it, feed wood to it and all like that. I guess the other ones were stoking it and all. Verse 6, a perpetual fire shall be kept burning on the altar not to go out. That is so cool. Uh, let's see. The fire about the use of which the expression tamid is used, that by which the lamps of the candelabrum or the menorah were kindled with reference to which it is said to light the camps continuously <clears throat> should, should be ignited from the fire on the outer altar. Wow, that's kind of cool. <clears throat> so the menorah is going and the altar is going to light always in the Mishkan or the tabernacle. Looks like. And if that's not right, please put something in the comments with some references so we can check it out for ourselves. So, and this is the ritual of the meal offering, the minha offering. Aaron's son shall present it before Hashem in front of the altar. And we learned from a few lessons ago, the front side is the, the east side of the altar. So, a handful of choice flour and oil of the meal offering shall be taken from it with all the frankincense that is on the meal offering or the minha offering. And this token portion shall be turned into smoke on the altar as pleasing odor to Hashem. What is left of it shall be eaten by Aaron and his sons. It shall be eaten as unleavened cakes in the sacred precinct. Oh, they got a special area where they're supposed to eat. They shall eat it in the enclosure of the tent of meeting. It shall not, more, verse 10, be baked with leaven. I've given it as their portion from my offerings by fire. It is most holy like the sin offering, the het, or the hata, I think it's the hata offering, and the asham offering. So it is like the sin offering, the hata offering, and the asham offering, the guilt offering. Only the males among Aaron's descendants may eat of it as they do for all time throughout the ages from Hashem's, holes, from Hashem's offering by fire. Anything that touches these shall become holy. <clears throat> so let's see. All the males from Rashi, even one with a bodily blemish. But why is this state? So if you, I don't know, whatever your blemish is, then you can eat it. Um, because not all um, Kohen were, you might be in the family of the Kohen, but if you had a blemish, maybe one arm, you have like a short arm or something like that or something, um, then you can't serve. But you can still eat and take part of the, the offering, which is really cool. So if you say for the purpose of permitting the eating of the meal offering to such a priest, then that is redundant because he's already been stated. Okay. Um, but it's intended to include the priest with bodily blemishes in the right of apportionment alluded to in the preceding verse. I have given it to them as their portion. That is, they may not only eat holy food if such is given to them by their fellow priests, but they are entitled to participate in the appor apportionment. And you'll find that in the Sifra and also in Zavachim 102a. Okay, in the in the oral tour. And that, wow, that's the end of our first reading. So it looks like we were just given the instructions for the Tamid offering. Every day this offering has to happen. It looks like it's a... You have an Ola offering in there and a Minha portion that goes with this daily morning ritual offering. And usually with the word ritual, it's something that's going to be happening over and over again. So um, if anybody got anything incorrect, or, or, or if I got anything correct, excuse me, put, please let me know down in the um, comments with your references. And then it looks like we, <clears throat> as they clean out the altar, the ash goes, they make a, pe a heap on the side of the altar and then I guess when they're ready they take it to the outside of the camp in a pure place and they deliver the ashes there so okay well let's get ready for our second reading okay let's get into our second reading it's we're going to be in Vaikra or Leviticus chapter 6 Pasuk 
12 or verse 12, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, this is the offering that Aaron and his son shall offer to Hashem on the occasion of his anointment. A tenth of an ephah of choice flour as a regular meal offering, half of it in the morning and half of it in the evening. I'm going to pause for a second because I don't understand what's going on here. The ordinary priest too, this is Rashi, offer a tenth part of the ephah of flour on the day they are installed into the priestly service. The high priest, however, offers one every day, as it is said, <clears throat> a continual meal offering, half in the morning and half thereof in the evening. And the priest among his sons that is anointed in his stead, that is, every high priest, shall offer it as a statute forever. So it looks like um, this other offering here in verse uh, 7, that's offered... The minha offering, with the, that's the, the forever offering, the tamid offering, the continual offering, morning, the continual morning offering. <clears throat> and then, but when you, but when, but when you are anointed to be the high priest, you are going to bring a tenth of ephah. Um, oh, wait, let's see. On the occasion of the anointment, you offer half in the morning, half in the evening. Okay, so that's your anointment offering. Okay. But when I, when we were reading Rashi, it sounded like that's something that's happening all the time. So I'm a little bit discombobulated. Let's read on and see what the Torah um, and the sages say to help us out. Maybe you got it. You probably got it. I'm jacked up. Okay. Verse 14. It shall be prepared with oil on a griddle. You shall bring it well soaked and offer it as a meal offering um, of baked slices of pleasing odor to Hashem. And so shall the priest anointed from amongst his sons to succeed him prepare it. It is Hashem's, a law for all time. It to be turned entirely into smoke. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, let's see if somebody else besides Rashi has something to say about this. Nope. All right. Nothing. So it's his sons bringing this. So too, verse 16, every meal offering of a priest shall be a whole offering. It shall not be eaten. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, so now we're getting, now that we know what the offerings are, the type of offerings and how to have the frankincense. Now we're learning when to do, we're learning from the Torah, Kohanim, the Torah of the, or the instructions of the Kohanim, the high priest. And the priests, we're learning when and where they do these things now that we know what they are. So verse, um, <clears throat> let's go to verse 17. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to Aaron and his sons thus. Now this is the ritual of the hata offering, the sin offering. Yep, hatat offering. Hatat, uh, yeah, the Torah hatat, bim kom. In, in the place, be my calm, be my calm. Mm. This is the ritual of the sin offering. The sin offering shall be slaughtered before Hashem at the spot where the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is most holy. Wow. So for the hata, the sin offering, where it's slaughtered it is also now holy, the place. That's why it says be my calm. The place where they slaughter it is also holy. Wow. So this is a, this is different. Okay, so verse 19. Let's wait. Let me just see if Rashi says something. Bear with me. I'm so curious today. No. Uh oh, we got a Bromban. Okay. Uh it he commanded concerning the offerings of the following the burnt offering. And the, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, sorry. Uh no Rambam. You can read it. It's just a little bit long <clears throat> for what we're trying to do. Okay, verse 19, the priest who offers it as a sin offering, hatat offering, shall eat of it. It shall be eaten in the sacred precinct, which I just checked out in Hayenu, um, the publication from Chabad.org. The sacred precinct is actually the courtyard of the Mishkan or tabernacle, um, which is within this, it's within the enclosure. So it's, it sounds like a food court a little bit. 
uh, shall be eaten in the sacred precinct in the enclosure of the tent of meeting. Enclosure as in within the boundaries of the Mishkan, not in, under, whatever. It's somewhere in the boundaries. <clears throat> Verse 20. Anything that touches its flesh shall become holy. And any of its blood is, is spattered upon a garment. Excuse me. And if any of its blood is spattered upon a garment, you shall wash the bespattered part in the sacred precinct. An earthen vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken. If it was boiled in a copper vessel, the vessel shall be scoured and rinsed with water. Only the males in the priestly line may eat of it. It is most holy. Let's see what's going on here. <clears throat> Uh, the priest shall either of thus you learn that the statement, the priest that offers it for sin offering shall eat it. It is not intended to exclude other priests, that is, the ones that did not actually perform the rites of the sacrifice. It's only to exclude from it eating those priests who were at that time unfit to bring it as the hata offering. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, ooh. Okay, <laughs> let's get into this little controversial thing. Um, so Ibn Ezra says, scripture states it is most holy with regard to every male because only the perfect may eat from a sin offering whose organs are offered and is brought for atonement for sins. Males are more perfect than females. Even a small child is called a male. A male who is 13 years old is considered an adult as our fathers have transmitted. Okay. Okay, so that is verse 22. Verse 23. But no sin offering, no hatat offering may be eaten from which any blood is brought into the tent of meeting for expiation in the sanctuary. Any such shall be consumed in fire. So if a hatat offering is uh, <coughs> excuse me, brought into the tent of meeting for expiation in the sanctuary, I'm thinking like, um, like the one where... Um, uh, maybe like uh, the one where you, is it Yom Kippur? The one where you offer a bull for the whole community or something like that. Something where there was sin, you didn't know it and a whole thing or I don't know, something like that. What's the, uh, a Ola offering, I guess. A Ola, yeah, Ola offering. Those seem to be where no one can eat it. So maybe it's talking about that. Why am I sitting here when I could just look up what Rashi said? This means that if the priest brought any of the blood of an external sin offering, one, the blood of which was to be sprinkled on the outer altar and to the interior, it becomes invalid and must be burnt. Oh, wow. I don't know what kind of offering that is that would do that. Mama, you got something short. <clears throat> uh, this is the, that's the language of Rashi. According to his opinion, the phrase atone, oh, uh, his, okay, so what's happening here is, Ibn, uh, excuse me, Ramban Nachmanides is kind of looking at the way Rashi phrased that whole thing. What we just read about um, if the blood was be sprinkled, then it's invalid. He's looking at the language of it and saying, let's look at this a little bit further and see what else we can glean from this instead of just taking only what Rashi said. Let's go a little bit deeper. Um, okay, so we're still in our second read. Let's continue. <clears throat> Chapter 7, verse 1. This is the ritual of the guilt offering. Let's check out the word we have here. That's the asham offering. Oh, and let me go back and, <clears throat> excuse me, got tickle in my throat. Let's go back and just make sure we see the, um, so here you have that hata offering. So you can see it, the word there, okay? Um, so this is the ritual of the asham offering. It is most holy. The Asham offering shall be slaughtered at the spot where the burnt offering or the Ola offering is slaughtered and the blood shall be dashed on all sides of the altar. I'm just going to um, see if we can get a resource because even when we were studying Asham, I didn't quite get what it's for. But if you know, it's kind of like an unintentional part. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm not sure. Okay. Um I think it's the one is it the one where you figure you find out you, the guilt and then you I don't know. I, I we, please put it below. I'm going to search again and go back through because I'm getting a little mixed up. Um 
Okay, so you bla dash the blood on all sides of the altar. Verse 3, all its fat shall be offered. The broad tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them at the loins, and the protuberance on the liver, which shall be removed with the kidneys. So this is for the Asham offering. The priest shall turn them into smoke on the altar as an offering by fire to Hashem. It is an Asham offering. So once those things get mo removed, the kidneys, the fat, um, that's going to turn into smoke. And um, that's the Asham offering. And verse 6, only the males in the priestly line may eat of it. It shall be eaten in the sacred precinct that is most holy. The, uh, <clears throat> okay, as the, I'm sorry, I'm reading the Hebrew. Uh, Kahata, Kahasham. Um, it says like as the hata offering is as the asham offering. Okay, so in English we have the guilt as the asham offering is like the hata offering. The same rule applies to both. It shall belong to the priest who makes expiation thereby. Verse two. So whoever is a priest doing it, that's who it goes to. <clears throat> and remember, these kohanim are doing this for the entire. How many million people are there in Israel? So it's not like a one. He's doing this for everybody. Okay. So let's see here. Verse 8. So to the priest who offers another person's burnt offering shall keep the skin of the burnt offering that was offered. Interesting. So now we got a little high talk. Um, shall I have no share in the skins of the priest that offereth. Any man's burnt offering, even the priest shall have to have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he has offered. <clears throat> Thus excluding that these have no share in the skins of the burnt offering. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Let's see. Is there anybody else that want to speak on that? Um. Okay, no. Oh, scripture reads to himself, even though earlier it said even to the priest, because it wants to further explain that the skin shall not be given to another Cohen. So whoever's doing the work here is the one yikes, is the one that gets the um the skin, the hide of the offering. And just I just know this from reading um Rambam, Maimonides, um that that um when you have the hides like that, the Kohanim can take these hides, they can sell them for money, whatever they want. They, it's theirs, and they can benefit from that hide. If they want to make a clothing out, whatever they want to do with it, they can benefit from it. So this is part of their income, if you will. Okay, verse 9. Further, any meal offering that is baked in the oven, and any that is prepared in a pan or on a griddle, shall belong to the priest who offers it. So now we're starting to see with these offerings, and I just want to, uh, this is the midha offering, when we see meal offering. So anytime <clears throat> that whoever's doing the work, that is theirs. So when we first learned about the offerings, we learned this is this portion. We learned uh, maybe like Hashem gets a portion and the priest gets a portion. The shalom, 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 shalom offering. Hashem priest and the person that brought it gets a portion or hola the Hashem gets that thing gets burned up in smoke nobody gets it just Hashem so we learn who gets the portion now we're learning okay now that we know that for the for the offerings that the Kohanim get a portion we're learning um whoever is doing the work is getting the portion and then there's other times where um the offering is being made and all oh, everybody can get you get a portion. You get. A, we all get a portion. Okay. <laughs> um, verse ten. But every other minha offering with oil mixed in or dry shall go to the sons of Aaron all alike. Okay. So there we go. So now, and there's a distinguishment there because this one was on a on a um oven some or griddle something that belongs to the priest but every other minha offering that has oil mixed in or it's dry it can go to the sons of aaron all alike and let's just make sure we are getting that understanding because it can get a little tricky in here this is a free will free will <laughs> free will meal offering okay this is the meal offering of the sinner and the meal offering of jealousy in which there was no oil mm. that's what the or dry means is what Rashi saying, mm, we gonna looks like we're gonna hit that in numbers. Okay. 
that's the end of our second portion. Okay, let's jump into our third portion. Portion. Ha! Third portion. We invite Cry, chapter 7. Um, verse 11 or Pasuk 11. This is the ritual of the sacrifice of well-being that one may offer to Hashem. Uh, and let's just make sure we know what offering we're offering here. Oh, look, it's a Hashalamim. Hashalamim. Okay, so we're in that peace offering again. And why am I doing this? Because in English, you just see sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Da -da -da -da. And, and there, it doesn't work like that. It's, uh, let me think. I think this word might mean. Yep. So this word means sacrifice, but these sacrifices have names. So we can just say the name and then you'll know exactly what we're talking about. <clears throat> because you might have seen it called peace offering earlier or whatever. So now we know we're back to the Shalomim offering. Okay. One who offers it for Thanksgiving shall offer together with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes with oil mixed in unleavened wafers spread with oil and cakes of choice flour with oil mixed in well soaked this offering with cakes of leavened bread added shall be offered along with one's thanksgiving sacrifice of well-being looks like if you want to bring the sacrifice your shalomim offering you can also have some cakes brought in too some meal offering uh, and you can offer it with cakes of hamets, hamets. And what is hamets? That's a leaven. So it's not just a wafer; it's an actual bread, like what, like what we eat, Wonder Bread. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, so make that thing rise when you give in that to the show. Uh, don't give me that flat one. Okay, verse 14. Out of this, the person shall offer one of each kind as a gift to Hashem. It shall go to the priest who dashes the blood of the offering of the sh shalamim. Ha shalamim. Okay, and we know that the dashing is when you throw that blood, sprinkle that blood at the base of the altar. Verse 15. And the flesh of the shalamim sacrifice of well being shall be eaten on the day that it is offered. None of it shall be set aside to mourning. Okay, so if you're bringing that in, you better bring your appetite with it. Because remember, on the Shalomim offering, Hashem gets a portion, the priest gets the portion, and you get the portion for bringing it in. So bring your appetite because it's going to be a barbecue. So um, let's see here. It should be eaten only during the day, on the meaning the day of the slaughtering and the following night. So you get the whole day to eat it because you're bringing something pretty big usually. So you bring bring all your peoples and you guys get to eat there at the um, temple with the priest. How cool is that? They did the work. Verse 16. If, however, the sacrifice is offered, the sacrifice that is offered, <coughs> excuse me, is a votive or a free will offering, it shall be eaten on the day that one offers a sacrifice and what is left of it shall be eaten on the morrow. So let's see. It's a zavah, zavah karabano. Um, I'm thinking. Okay, so we have this word here, the neder, the neder, neder, a uh, votive offering. Let's see if we get any help with that. <clears throat> so this, it sounds like it's. I don't know if it's a shalomim, a type of shalomim offering. I'm not sure. But whatever, if it's that kind, um, you got to eat some of it on the day and some of it on the next day. Okay. Verse 17. What is then left of the flesh of the sacrifice shall be consumed in fire on the third day. Okay, so... We got a timeline on this offering. Like the parts of the sacrifice where the scripture designates for burning. However, it should not be burnt on the altar. Okay. <clears throat> so this is from Ibn Ezra. He's saying you burn what you're supposed to burn. 
Uh, but you know, like if you're supposed to be whatever the ritual says, I uh, gets burnt up for this one. But it's not gonna be burned on the altar. So this is interesting. Where is there a? Uh, I didn't get to eat the rest of my food in the three day altar. <laughs> like it burns. Like what's going on here? I'm so curious. Though. Is there anybody else? Ron Bob. Oh man, Ron. Every time you come on here, you got so long. <laughs> uh. Uh, and it's not connected. It remains. The verse states that which was left over of the flesh of the offering, which is not eaten on the day. It was. Um, I don't know. I just don't know. Hmm. Okay. All right. <clears throat> verse eighteen. If any of the flesh of the sacrifice of well being, and let me see. Let's see if we can go back here. There we go. So we're back to the Shalamin, but uh, Shalamav, Shalam, Shalamav is like his, if any of the flesh of his Shalamim offering is kind of like what it's saying, uh, is eat, if any of the flesh of that Shalamim offering is eaten on the third day, it shall not be acceptable, it shall not count for the one who offered it, it shall be an offensive thing, and that person who eats of it shall bear the guilt oh okay so his nephesh of let me manu ola tisha he will bear okay okay wow it is an offensive thing okay so oh oh uh oh it's pigul let me see. It's pigul when if you do that, you just invalidated your whole thing. That's what it looked like to me. I don't know. Or maybe if you try to eat the flesh to follow the rules, that part of it is invalidated. So I'm not sure if just what's been considered pigul is um, that you ate it out of time or if your whole whole shalamim offering the votive uh is pigul pigul as you saw is an important word to know it's a foul thing or unclean sacrificial flesh okay <clears throat> uh ashkenaz pronunciation is pigle <laughs> let me hear somebody say that's pigle that's pigul that's that word verse 19 flesh that touches anything impure shall not be eaten it shall be consumed in fire. As for other flesh, only one who is pure may eat such flesh. Interesting. So you can't be running around here not pure eating. Is that is that what that means? That's a harsh thing. How do you do that? Uh, part of the remaining size permitted to be eaten. All that are clean may eat flesh. Why is it stated? Why should it not be assumed that are clean? Okay. It, why should it not be assumed that a clean person may eat of the sacrifices? But since it is stated, and the blood of thy sacrifice shall be poured upon the altar, but the flesh thou mayest eat. I might have thought that as it speaks of thy sacrifices and states thou mayest eat, only the owner of the sacrifice may eat the peace offering. But for this reason, it stated here, all that are clean may eat the flesh. Oh. So, I'm not sure. It looked like, it looked like we had a little... Uh, <clears throat> but like we have a little powwow here. I'm not sure what's going on here, but does it mean the one that brought it they have to be clean, or everybody that's clean can eat? You can eat, and you can. We all can. Okay. Verse twenty. But the person who, in a state of impurity, so okay, let's just get these words so you can see what they look like. This is um when this is tame. This is when something becomes ritually impure. Here's the waste that you can become ritually impure, sexually, uh, religiously, ceremonially. Um, and you can defile yourself sexually. Okay, so you can see that there. Okay, so that is the word tame. That's to anything that is impure. So when anything that is tame shall not be eaten and shall be consumed in a fire. Um, but only the one who is 
pure. Let's hit that word for you. Tahor. So Tahor is pure, clean, clean. Think more clean. Um, not so fresh and so clean, clean, clean. Not that way. Just ceremonially, you, you did your mikvah, you, you, whatever your it takes to to be like that. So tahor and um, tame. Flesh that touches anything impure, <clears throat> tame, shall not be eaten; it shall be consumed in fire. As for other flesh, only the one who is pure tahor may eat such flesh. But the person who, in a state of tame, eats flesh from Hashem's sacrifice of Shalamim, that person shall be cut off from kin. So if you are in a state of, of tame and you eat a sacrifice, the Shalamim sacrifice, you are cut off, like out. Wow, that's woo. Wow. Um... I'm just trying to see if that you get kicked out of the camp or okay. Verse 21. When a person touches anything tame and pure, be it human impurity or an impure animal or any impure creatures, and he eats his flesh and eats flesh from Hashem's sacrifice of Shalamim, that person shall be cut off from kin. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Verse 22. And Hashem spoke to Moses saying. Speak to the Israelite people thus. You shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat. Fat from animals that died or were torn apart by beasts may be put to any use, but you must not eat of it. And if anyone, verse 25, eats the fat of animals from which offerings by fire may be, may be made to Hashem, that person who eats it shall be cut off from kin. If, let me read that again. If anyone eats the fat of animals from which offerings are made by fire, Excuse me. If anyone eats the fat of the fat of animals for which offerings by fire may be made to Hashem, that person who eats it shall be cut off from kin. So I don't know if that is. Let's see if that does that mean like they got it ready for um they were getting it ready for an offering and somebody quick <laughs> took that bad boy and ate it. Uh, is the beast of itself as an offering so that the unconsecrated animal will be excluded from this prohibition? Um. Yeah, it sounds like this this animal was ready to be used for a service and somebody ate it. That person gets cut off because you knew that thing was going for an offering of some sort. Verse 26. And you must, if I'm, please, comments with some references because I don't know. And you must not consume any blood. <clears throat> uh, and I'm going to hit that word for you so you can see that word. No dom, like Adam, Adam, no blood, no dam. Uh, you must not consume any blood, either of bird or animal, in any of your settlements. Verse 27. Anyone who eats blood shall be cut off from kin. So this is the cut off from kin section. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah. Verse 28. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the Israelite people thus. The offering to Hashem from a sacrifice of well-being, Shalomim, must be presented by the one who offers that Shalomim offering to Hashem. So tell the Israelite people, the offering to Hashem from a Shalomim offering, it should be presented by the one who's offering that Shalomim offering. One's own hand shall present Hashem's offerings by fire. The offerer shall present the fat with the breast, the breast to be elevated, or uh, let me see if we can find the word there, as an elevation offering before Hashem. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not so quick. Is it? Uh, oh, no, 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 not that one. I don't know, you sprinkle the oto tenif. I thought that was the fall. Oh. You wave it. You sprinkle the you tanufa. Okay. 
you're waving this offering. So, <clears throat> excuse me. This so-called elevation offering is a waving offering. Uh, oh, that was weird. I just hit this thing. So, okay. So we have another type of offering called the waving offering or the uh, nufa, tenufa. That's if you will. So nufa is waving. Okay. Uh, hello. Okay. All right. So we'll look for it because now we're by your own hands, the offerer shall present the fat with the breast, the breast to be waved as a wave offering before Hashem. The priest shall, verse 31, turn the fat into smoke on the altar and the breast shall go to Aaron and his sons. And the right thigh from your sacrifice of Shalamim, um, you shall present to the priest as a gift. He is from among Aaron's sons who offers the blood and the fat of the offer of the Shalamim. He shall get the right thigh as his portion. So now we start to know that even the cutlets, the parts that they are to get. For I, verse 34, have taken the breast of the elevation offering. And let's just... The swinging, the wave offering. For I have taken the um, nufa, tenu, ha, tenu, ha, tenufa offering and, and the thigh of the gift offering from the Israelites, from their shalomim offering and given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons as their due from the Israelites for all time. Okay, we got a lot of offerings. <laughs> ah. Oh, shuk means shok, not shuk. Shuk is a store. The souk. Sh this, the shok is the thigh of the terumah. The, okay. Oh, I thought ter a terumah was, okay, so that's an offering in general or some contribution okay so we got a lot of things going on it's still shalomim offerings but it looks like they got like little subcategories those shall be the pre the perquisites and the perquisites of his sons from hashem's offering by fire once they have been in inducted to serve hashem as priests so they're not getting this if they didn't get inducted into Kohenness. Okay, verse 36. And these Hashem commanded to be given them once they had been anointed, <clears throat> Aaron's sons, as a due from the Israelites for all time through the ages. So this is a hukat. A hukat. I said so law. A hukat olam. Forever. Um, 37, such are the rituals of the burnt offering, the meal offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the offering of ordination and the sacrifice of well-being. Such are the rituals of, let's see it, uh, Zotat Torah. These are the instructions for the Ola offering, which you might see as the burnt offering, the offering that goes up in smoke, the Minha offering, the meal offering, um, which can, looks like it also, can also be meat too. And the hatat offering, the sin offering, the asham, the guilt offering, asham, and the, let me see, no, nope, that's for the installation, la min lu, la mi lu in, la mi sounds like mellow, like com fullness, complete, to make full, okay. And um, the, uh, let's see, and the, also the um, Hashalamim, okay, the sacrifice of well-being. So we have all our, verse 20, 37 is going where you're going to get all your, um, your offerings so you can practice your Hebrew. Verse 38, um, <clears throat> Here's the rituals of those offerings with which Hashem charged Moshe on Mount Sinai when commanding that the Israelites present their offerings to Hashem in the wilderness of Sinai. 
Sorry that took a little bit longer, but it's really important to practice your Hebrew and get to know. It doesn't just say offerings, offerings, offerings. These actually have names. So, you know. Anyway, that's the end of our third reading, and let's get ready for our fourth reading. Okay, our fourth offering, fourth offering, <laughs> our fourth reading is in Vayikra, chapter 8, verse 1. Let's go. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Take Aaron along with his sons and the vestments the anointing oil, the bull of the what kind of offering? Anybody, anyone, scream it out. Okay. The bull of the sin offering, uh, which we know as the hatat, the hata, the sin offering. Hatat is uh, the sin offering of, hata is sin offering. Um, <clears throat> so the bull of the hata. The two rams and the basket of unleavened bread. Uh, and assemble the community leadership at the entrance of the tent of me. And Moshe did as Hashem commanded him. So everybody's getting, the not everybody, but the leadership is getting brought to the entrance of the tent of me. And when the leadership was assembled at the entrance of the tent of me, and Moshe said to leadership, this is what Hashem has commanded to be done. Tav! <laughs> Um, then Moshe brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water. He put on the tunic, <clears throat> he put the tunic on him, girded him with the sash, clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him, girding him with the decorated band with which he tied it to him. Verse eight, he put on the breastplate on him and he put into the breastplate the urum and the thumum. <clears throat> uh, and he set the headdress on his head and on the, on the headdress, in the front, he put on the gold frontlet, the holy diadem, as Hashem had commanded Moshe. Moshe took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it, thus consecrating them. He sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, anointing the altar, all its utensils, the laver with its stand to consecrate them. Verse 12, he poured some of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head, anointed him to consecrate him. Moshe then brought Aaron's sons forward and clothed them in tunics, girded them with sashes, and wound turbans upon them, as Hashem had commanded Moshe. Okay, so we get the sacral, sacred, sacral vestment dressing um, as Moshe is dressing them in front of leadership. So the leadership of Israel can see it so they know who is who. Undisputed. That's the end of our fourth reading. Okay, the fifth reading. We are in Perek Vaikra, Perek 8, chapter 8, Pasuk 14. Fifth reading, let's go. He led forward the bull of sin offering, the bull of the Hata offering. Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bull of the Hata offering, and it was slaughtered. Moshe took the blood with his finger put some on each of the horns of the altar, purifying the altar. Then he poured out the blood at the base of the altar. Thus he consecrated it in order to make expiation upon it. So the altar just got consecrated. <clears throat> so he can sacrifice the bull, which is the expiation for the Hata offering for Aaron and his sons. Moshe then took all the fat that was about the entrails and the protuberance of the liver and the two kidneys and their fat and turned them into smoke on the altar. Okay, and verse 17, the rest of the bull, its hide, its flesh, and its dung, he put to the fire outside the camp, as Hashem had commanded Moshe. Then he brought forward the ram of burnt offering, and the ram of the olah offering, okay, the burnt offering that goes up, and Aaron and his sons, they made the uh, they laid their hands upon the ram's head, and just want to show you this word. Um, it's uh oh, why is it? I think it's going crazy. It's the vice vice the smicha to lean. They're leaning. They're putting weight on. It's not just like oh. They're leaning. This is a like a almost like a transference. You going? This is serious. You putting some weight on there. So the same, uh, samach 
or the smichu, because it's a verb. They're leaning. Their hands on the ram's head. Verse 19, and it was slaughtered. Moshe dashed the blood against all the sides of the altar. The ram was cut up into sections, and Moshe turned the head, the sections, and the suet into smoke on the altar. Verse 21, Moshe washed the entrails and the legs with water and turned all of the ram into smoke. That was the Ola offering for a pleasant, pleasing odor, an offering by fire, as Hashem had commanded Moshe. Okay. Wow. That's the end of the fifth, uh, fifth reading. The consecration of the priest. Let's get ready for our sixth reading. Okay. Sixth reading. We are in Perak Vayikra, Perak 8, Pasuk 22. I hope you're getting used to these words. Okay. He brought forward the second ram, the ram of ordination. Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the ram's head. They did the smicha, smichu. They leaned. Um, they leaned on the ram's head and it was slaughtered. So as they're leaning, Moshe is doing the slaughtering. Moshe took some of its blood and put it on the ridge of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. Verse 24, Moshe then brought forward, <clears throat> excuse me, the sons of Aaron and put some of the blood on the ridges of their right ears and on the thumb of their right hands and on their big toes of their right feet. And the rest of the blood Moshe dashed against, dashed against every side of the altar. Verse 25, he took the fat, the broad tail, all the fat about the entrails, the protuberance of the liver, the two kidneys and their fat and the right thigh. From the basket of unleavened bread that was before Hashem, he took one cake of unleavened bread, one cake of oil bread, and one wafer, placed them on the fat parts and on the right thigh. He placed all of these on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his sons and elevated them as an elevation offering before Hashem. And let's just go back into, just make sure we know, elevated means a swing, a waving. It's the tenufa, tenufa um, offering. So he placed these on the palm of the hands, and the and they they tenufa this before Hashem. Uh, and then Moshe took them from their hands and turned them into smoke on the altar. Whoosh, made it go up with the Ola offering. This was an ordination offering for a pleasing odor. It was an offering of fire to Hashem. And so you see that they had to do that waving as part of the, with that, whatever they had in their arms, oops, they had to do that as part of their ritual. Verse 29, Moshe took the breast and elevated it. He didn't just elevate it. He did what? He moved to and fro. So he moved, that's the verb. He he moved tenufa, the swinging or waving offering before Hashem. Um, <clears throat> it was Moshe's portion of the ram of ordination as Hashem had commanded Moshe. So for this, he gets a portion. Now what's interesting is, does he get the portion as the priest would have get the portion? get the portion or is this something special um oops i'm just trying to see if there's any commentary and there's nothing oh dear sages hachameen that's the end of our sixth reading oh wow <laughs> okay our seventh reading starts with perik we are still in vayikra perik eight pasuk 30 and Moshe took some of the anointing oil. Let me see if we can find this. Moshe, Mishim, Minhadam. Uh, yeah, so he took some Mish, Mish, Ha, Mish, Ha. Is the anointing oil. Okay, Mishim, Mishim, Mish, oh, it's that he took the anointing oil. Okay, the kach, no, the the uh, 
Biakah, Moshe. Shemen, Shemen is the oil, and Mi Hamish Ha is a looks like it's in a portion of that oil. So that's where you get some, where it says Moshe took some of the anointing oil. That looks like that's where you get that a portion of it. Okay, so Moshe took some of that anointing oil and some of the blood that was on the altar and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his vestments and also upon his sons and upon their vestments. He consecrated Aaron and his vestments and also his sons and their vestments. Moshe, and I, I'm just thinking like, but I thought they're not supposed to get them dirty. <laughs> Moshe said to Aaron and his sons, boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of meat and eat it there with the bread that is in the basket of ordination as I commanded Aaron and his sons shall eat it. And whatever is left over of the flesh that and, and the bread you shall consume in fire. Verse 33, Pasuk 33, you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meat and for seven days until the day that your period of ordination is completed for your ordination will require seven days so aaron and them are supposed to stay in this tent of meeting for seven days they don't leave there's no bathroom in the tent of meeting and sound like whatever is there is the animals for ordination so this is kind of like this is supernatural here so <clears throat> verse 34 everything done today hashem has commanded to be done the seven days is to make expiation for you so that is what gets them um Tahor gets them clean so that they can do what they need to do. Their ritual, it takes seven days, Hashem is saying, to make this expiation so you can be clean, so you can go ahead and get Israel, um, so they can clean Israel and do all these things cleanly. Tahor, not Tame, not the opposite of clean. <laughs> um Verse 35, you shall remain at the entrance of the tent of me and day and night for seven days, keeping Hashem's charge that you may not die. For so I have been commanded. So, wow, that's where they're going to be. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that Hashem had commanded through Moshe. Wow. This is just a whole supernatural event happening here. Wow. So that's the end of our... Um, our tour portion, and you can see next week is Shemini. So we will, um, I'm guessing that's going to be after the seven days. So um, just because that word looks like eight. <laughs> so um, so let's let's uh, finish up here and let's get ready for our Haftarah. Okay. And if I didn't say, shout out to anyone that's celebrating Purim with their congregation. Um, that's an amazing story that we're to remember every year that anyone, it's just, it, just what an evil time um, to just say, to annihilate this group of people, our Jewish brothers and sisters. And every year we're to remember that. And in every country, this can happen. Like this is not some standalone story. We've seen it happen before. I'm not going to go into details, but you guys know what I'm talking about. And we need to uh, remember that even in our own countries, I'm in the U.S., this stuff, this can happen. So let's get focused on our, our, our Torah, go arm in arm with our um, Jewish brothers and sisters in, in synagogue and what, and, and, and just fight for them, fight, stand beside them, fight with them, fight for them. Because this poor, them, this ain't, this ain't no, uh, fairy tale. This stuff is real. And you need to remember it every year. So I just want to say that. Uh, okay. I know we're, ha I think we usually have it in February, right? But this year with the leap year and all, um, the extra month of Adar, it's in March. So it's today. Uh, and shout out to everyone that did the fast of Esther. Okay. So this Haftarah portion is um, kind of broken up. So it's Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 21 through chapter 8, verses 3. 
and also chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. So let's get into it. Thus said God of hosts, the God of Israel, add your, your Olah offerings, your burnt offerings, to your other sacrifices and eat the meat. For when I freed your ancestors from the land of Egypt, I did not speak with them or command them concerning burnt offerings or sacrifice, the Olah offerings or the Tavah. Um, I just want to show you. I don't think I showed you that word. Tavah. The sacrifice, the general word for sacrifices. I didn't speak with them or command them concerning burnt offerings, uh, Ola offerings or sacrifices, but this is what I commanded them. Do my bidding that I may be your God and you may be my people. Walk only in the way that I enjoin upon you, that it may go well with you. Yet they didn't listen or give ear. They followed their own counsels of willfulness of their evil hearts. They've gone backward, not forward. From the day your ancestors left the land of Egypt until today, and though I kept sending all my servants the prophets to them daily and persistently. They would not listen to me or give ear. They stiffened their necks. They acted worse than their ancestors. You shall say to all these, you shall say all these things to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not respond to you. Then say to them, this is the nation that would not obey the eternal their God, that would not accept rebuke. Faithfulness has perished, vanished from their mouths. Shear your locks and cast them away. Take up a lament on the heights, for God has spurned and cast off the brood that provoked such wrath. Verse 30. For the people of Judah have done what displeases me, declares God. They have set up their abominations in the house that they call by my name, and they have defiled it. And they built the shrines of Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters and fire, which I never commanded, which never came to my mind. Assuredly, a time is coming, declares God, when this people shall no longer speak of Topheth or the valley of Ben-Hinnom, but of the valley of slaughter. And they shall bury in Topheth until no room is left. The carcasses of this people shall be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth with none to frighten them off. And I will silence in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, the sound of mirth and gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and bride for the whole land shall fall to ruin. Chapter 8, verse 1. At that time, declare, declares God, the bones of the kings of Judah and its officers of the priests, of the prophets, and of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be taken out of their graves and exposed to the sun, <clears throat> the moon, and all the hosts of heaven that they loved and served and followed to which they turned and bowed down. They shall not be gathered for reburial. They shall become dumb upon the face of the earth. And death shall be preferable to life for all that are left of this wicked folk in all the other places to which I shall banish them, declares God of hosts. And we're going to go to chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 22 and 23. Thus said God, let not the wise glory in their wisdom, let not the strong glory in their strength, let not the rich glory in their riches, but only in this should one glory, in being earnestly devoted to me. For I, God, act with kindness, justice, and equity in the world. For in these I delight, declares God. Wow, okay, so learning all these rituals, we see that at the time of Jeremiah, these things were not be, being followed. Um, wow, that's the end of our Torah Parsha on ha and Haftarah. Thank you for studying with me this week and um, have a blessed Purim. Um, let's do what Hashem says. And again, let's join with the Jewish people and learn from them and, and, and walk forward as we understand better Hashem and the things that you require. So, May I, may I wish you a Shavuot Tov, a Shabbat Shalom and a Shavuot Tov. And I'll see you next time for the Torah portion 8.